You may be seated. Uh, before I lead in a word of prayer, I just want to give you an update. Uh, Mike Shirtliff was taken to the hospital the other evening, and uh, they actually thought he was having another stroke, but um, it, they diagnosed it as pneumonia. So pray for Mike and Carol during this time. As you know, Sandy Sherman is home, and um, Jerry was talking to Tammy, her daughter, the other day, and she's making progress and getting some strength back. Um, and uh, so anyway, we want to lift those dear saints up. You know, I was thinking as I was coming up to the pulpit here, what does the scripture say? Didn't Jesus say men and women ought always to pray? Let's go to God in prayer. Uh, gracious Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you for your eternal presence. And we know that our sin hides the glory, your glory this morning, and yet we also know too that your glory fills the whole earth, and we can see glimpses of that glory in creation, but we see the fullness of the glory of Jesus Christ on the pages of Scripture, and we gather here, uh, Heavenly Father, this morning to worship him. And as we lift him up, we know that we exalt you and we bless you. And we thank you so, so much for this time. Uh, we thank you that we can gather together uh, to unite our hearts in prayer and in worship and in fellowship. And we bless you that you've set, uh, ordained a time in the week where it should be set, set aside that we might uh, spiritually refocus, uh, renew our strength, and worship uh, our, our God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, we, we come here this morning by faith, and we believe by faith, uh, as the scriptures teach, that we inherit the promises of God. Uh, we thank you, Lord, that we don't have to work for salvation. Uh, we know that some have a better work ethic than others. Uh, some are more motivated than others. And yet we thank you that it all is consummated in, in the work of Christ at Calvary. Uh, whosoever believes may come, whosoever will may come. And so this morning, Lord, as we unite our hearts and our minds, and as we gather, uh, we gather at the foot of the cross, and we acknowledge you as the only Savior among men, and we, we gather to bless you, to renew our strength, uh, to confess our shortcomings, uh, to acknowledge that you're King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And, and so, Lord, as we, as we gather here this morning, uh, we pray that you would be pleased to meet us, that you would receive our worship, uh, because we come in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Uh, Father, thank you uh, that he constantly lives to make intercession for us, and thank you for the ministry of intercession, especially, Lord, as you, as you constantly do that for each and every one of us. And yet we, we thank you for the ministry of intercession where we can pray and lift up fellow saints before your throne of grace. And uh, we think of Sandy Sherman this morning, Lord. Encourage her heart. Uh, thank you so much for giving her the strength uh, to get home. And thank you for the added strength uh, that her family sees. Uh, we just pray that you would fill her with great, great joy and great strength as she waits upon you to renew that strength. Uh, also, Father, too, uh, lift up Mike. Um, use the medication, but Lord, we know that ultimately divine healing comes from you. And so we bring Mike before your throne of grace. Uh, also, Carol, encourage their hearts. Uh, we uh, look long for the time and look for the time where they might join us again in worship. Uh, also, Father, too, I, I lift up uh, Chuck Davis, um, encourage his heart um, during this time, uh, especially around the holidays. 
And uh, also, Father, too, uh, I think of uh, Keith Johnson. We thank you um, uh, for the strength that you've given Keith uh, each week uh, to be able to be here and to run sound, sound and uh, with, uh, with the dialysis that he has three times a week. And so we lift him up uh, before your throne of grace and uh, pray that you would continue to bless him and encourage his heart as well. And Father, then finally, there's so many things that we come uh, in here with today. Um, maybe it's a downcast spirit. Um, maybe it's a, a sin, a particular sin we're struggling with. Uh, maybe we're lacking faith uh, or joy. Uh, maybe uh, we're struggling to find peace during this time. Uh, and yet, uh, we've come to the right place uh, to hear the word of God and to worship and to seek your face. And we, we pray, Lord, uh, as you always do, that you would again meet us where we're at this hour, this day. Uh, we want to thank you for this time. We give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, at this particular time, Nick's going to read scripture. Nick? Good morning, everybody. Uh, first scripture reading is uh, John 20, verses 19 through 29, and that can be found on page 1052. Don't touch. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands inside. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, called Didymus, was one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were at the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came, stood among them, and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. <clears throat> Our second reading this morning is from the first chapter of Luke, verses 39 to 56, and that is on page 991 of the Red Church Bible. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel 
remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, even as he said to our fathers. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. This is the word of our Lord. What a tremendous passage of scripture. Amen? Let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, uh, we give you this time. Uh, In my weakness, may you be made strong, and may you speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So this past week, I read an article from Greg Laurie. Uh, He is an author and evangelist, pastor, and founder of Harvest Churches in California and Hawaii and Harvest Crusades. Uh, You may have heard of him. Well, the article was entitled, quote, Why I Have High Hopes for 2021. I think we all have high hopes for 2021 based on 2020, amen? Uh, He begins the article by saying, The year of the coronavirus pandemic, shutdowns and quarantine... The year of political upheaval, riots, and protests. 2020 seemed to bring out both the best and worst in people. As Charles Dickens' A Tale of Two Cities begins, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. That seems like a good summary of this year. Despite the chaos of 2020, I have hope for 2021, unquote. Uh, the best of times and the worst of times, uh, in my opinion, is a, a, little, a little hyperbole, right? Uh, 2020 was bad, but it was not the worst of times. Um, if you're a centurion, you could probably remember uh, some worse times than 2020. And 2020 was certainly not the best of times, right? Uh, Laurie did have a subcaption that I think we can all say amen to. He said, I don't know what 2021 holds, but I know who holds 2021. Amen? Amen. So folks, I was thinking we may not be living in the worst of times or the best of times, but we are certainly living in bizarre times. Uh, I said to Harold the other day, uh, not only is it bizarre, it's end times. And Harold echoed that thought. "This This is crazy stuff, right? If you go back to the year 2020 with political upheaval, it, that's not unusual. If you take a look at every, sing, every single year at some place on the globe, there's always political upheaval. That's just part of living in this world. And yet, as believers, even despite all the upheaval, we still have hope. We hold out hope. That there's always a better tomorrow, right? Maybe not in this world, but in the life to come, there's always a better tomorrow. Uh, Laurie used this acronym for hope. Holding on with patient expectation. Holding on with patient expectation. And I started to think about that. Isn't this the spirit of those who hope in God Almighty, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who was none other than the Lord Jesus Christ? This is is the indomitable spirit and the enduring hope that every single believer has, that there will be a better tomorrow. And, And I believe that Mary, in many ways, expressed this very hope of expectation. Uh, The angel appeared to her and made specific promises, special promises. Mary heard the word of God, and she embraced those promises. And she had an expectant hope. Now, in the context, if you take a look at it, it's regarding the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. But it doesn't matter if if the promises of God are delivered by an angel or by God himself, whether it's the fulfillment of Scripture, or it's the promises of God that come off the pages of Scripture, we embrace those promises, amen? We hear them and we embrace them. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of Christ. 
And, and as I look at the scripture here, Mary embraced the promises of God long ago, and that's what we do today. We embrace the promises of God. This is the blessed hope of all who embrace the promises of God, that there will be a better tomorrow through Jesus Christ our Lord. Take a look at verses 46 and 47. Mary articulates this hope. My soul exalts the Lord and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. I love the words, God my Savior. I love the fact that she exalts in God and rejoices in God. This is the spirit of the Holy Spirit that God has shed abroad in the heart of everyone who has received Jesus Christ. This is the hope of salvation. It's the hope of deliverance. It's an expected hope because hope is found in God my Savior. Now, there's a, there's a number of things that I want to kind of comment on here regarding this phrase. Uh, first of all, notice the personal pronoun, my. Now, back in grade school, remember when you learned English, they went through nouns and verbs and adjectives and pronouns and adverbs and all that stuff that you hated? Or at least I hated it, right? I greatly appreciate it now. My is a possessive pronoun. Mary owned God as her Savior. My is personal in nature. It's regarding a Savior who saves and delivers. That's what a Savior does. And so as you look at this here, I would say to you, salvation is, and deliverance is personal. You have to come to a place personally where you engage and embrace the promises of God and are saved from God's wrath, the wrath to come, upon everyone who rejects Jesus Christ. You've got to run and flee to the cross. Uh, this is, uh, this is, salvation is personal. Deliverance is personal. It's not corporate. It's not institutional. Uh, tell me, will the U.S. government give you this expectant hope of deliverance from the wrath of God? Will the U.S. government save us? It's crumbling before our very eyes. Will a stimulus check keep you from getting sick and dying? I mean, my goodness, they can't even pass it, let alone agree on it. 200, or 200, 600, 2,000, somewhere in between. Who knows? Uh, what I do know is that they've pretty much ruined everything that we've had in this country that's been good. Well, not everything. There are still some good things in this country. Still the best place to live, but they're quickly ruining it. And as I look at government, institutions, corporations, they seem to just really royally mess things up. I mean, wasn't it really like the founding fathers just wanted a very simple, small government and leave the power to the states? Well, that seems to be gone. Salvation and deliverance, and as I look at this, salvation and deliverance doesn't come through political solutions. It doesn't come from what politicians promise. I said this the other month, but tell me, will Donald Trump or Joe Biden, what will they do for you, or what will any other politician or president do for you when you're laying on your deathbed? I guarantee you they won't even visit you. <laughs> even if you gave them the phone number, your phone number, they probably wouldn't even call you. W will a tax cut help you? Will an extra allowable contribution to your IRA or 401k help you during that time? You won't even be able to spend it before you check out. And so what these past two decades have taught us is this. If you follow politics and you follow the news, 
Our institutions are morally corrupt. They're ethically bankrupt, top to bottom. There is no salvation in the U.S. government. The love of money has ruined corporate America. Uh, you know, Judas sold his soul for 30 pieces of silver. Corporate America would do it for less. And they have. Political ideology has bankrupted the justice keepers at the highest levels of government. Lady Justice, who's supposed to be blindfolded, no longer blindfolded. Bribes and political favors rule the day. It's about who can line their pockets when they're in power. Forget the American people. It's all about the elite. You know, whether it's if the Democrats are in power, they line their pockets. If the Republicans are in power, they line their pockets. Raw power influence. American politics. World politics. That's what it's about. Also, salvation and deliverance is not found in social solutions. Uh, from social engineering to eugenics to various ethnic and racial and social movements to affirmative action and to social activism, these movements never have and never will save you or anyone else from the human plight and condition of being under the judgment of God and sin. Uh, from a social perspective, two wrongs don't make a right. Two, two wrongs have never made anything right. Educational and academic solutions are a facade. Send your kid to college. He'll get a great, or she'll get a great education, and, and you know, the, the world will be at their fingertips. Uh, really? Uh, educated, being educated is important. Learning is essential. But getting a degree, it's not the end-all, be-all solution, is it? So one has a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, a doctoral degree, fine, that's awesome, right? What is it going to do? It doesn't change the fact that you still need a savior. So it puts a little bit more money in your pocket. But you still need a savior. You feel good about yourself. You got education, but you still need a savior. And you know, I take a look at those institutions, they have failed politically. Economically, financially, educationally, they failed. They don't teach anybody anything, except Marxism. The current reality is that going to a higher learning institution typically puts one into debt for years. You hope that you can pay it off. And they get brainwashed in the process. And they come out, and they're more Marxist, and they're more godless than ever, ever before. Uh, do you want to send your kid off to a higher education uh, institution for that? Hundreds of thousands of dollars, Marxist thinking, and they come out godless. Who would, who would want to do that? Go become a plumber, <laughs> an electrician, you know, a carpenter. Jesus was a carpenter. And he was a good one, too. And, you know, think about it. These people are less free in their thinking. It's all cookie-cutter approach. They don't think for themselves anymore. One can actually make the argument in Romans chapter 1, verse 22, they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. Or again, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? I'm telling you, you can have degree upon degree upon degree, and you never have the wisdom and the discernment and the goodness and the wholesomeness that comes from this good book and having a relationship with Jesus Christ. I knew this guy years ago. He had a sixth grade education. He worked on boilers. He was mighty in the scriptures. And I'm telling you, he was smarter than anybody who had ever come out of Harvard. I was blessed to have known him. So I take a look at the social, the educational, the government. Top to bottom, it's a complete mess. And so what about, what about the church as the pillar and the foundation of the truth in society? Will the church save you? 
Uh, today there are calls for spiritual solutions and theological solutions and institutional church solutions. Church ain't going to save you. Not happening. The institutional church has failed. It has been taken captive through worldly philosophy. Paul warned in Colossians chapter 2 about not being led away and, and taken captive through worldly philosophy. And yet the institutional church is captive today. It's become spiritually compromised. Kumbaya language, Marxist thinking, liberation theology, and anti-scripture thinking. That's what you get in the institutional church. It's fallen into the current PC game. Yeah, we're going to welcome we're going to welcome everyone who is immoral. It doesn't God loves you whichever which way you are. It's not according to scripture. God loves you, but he doesn't promote the sin. He doesn't sanction it. He doesn't bless it. Many denominations, their churches, their schools are doctrinally and categorically apostate according to scripture today. It's right before your very eyes. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. There's a falling away, and it's right before, and that's end time. It's right before our very eyes. And so what is, what is my point in touching on all this? Because, trust me folks, it's not my goal to depress you when you come into church. My goal is to, that you would hear from God that you would know his word, and that we would all be spiritually recalibrated in our thinking. And this is my point. There's no hope in these human institutions. Every single one of us will die someday. We don't live forever in this world. We will die. And the only relevant option is what Mary said God, my Savior. He's the only option, folks. Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 24, for unless you believe that I am He, you shall die in your sins. And yes, the gospel of Jesus Christ is that exclusive. Jesus said, no man comes to the Father except through Him. He's the gate. He's the door to enter in. Or you don't make it to heaven. And this leads me to another thought here too. Um, and it's about Mary, Jesus' mother. Now, she's also known as the Virgin Mary, the Blessed Mother, the Mother of God. But if you take a look here at the, at the text, she too is personally in need of salvation and spiritual deliverance herself. In her own words, my soul exalts the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. My soul, my spirit, my Savior. I need help, God. Mary was a sinner like all of us. She needed deliverance and salvation too. Now stop and think about this for a minute. Because in some circles, isn't Mary put up on a pedestal? Spiritually, she's put on a pedestal for giving birth to Christ. She's been given the title Queen of Heaven. She's been given the title of Co-Redemptrix. She's bowed down to. She's worshipped. She's prayed to. As if she has some spiritual or miraculous power to intercede for you. This is in direct conflict and violation with what the Scriptures teach. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, there is one intercessor between God and man, and it's the man Christ Jesus. Mary cannot help you on your deathbed either. And in fact, all these titles, all the adulation and all the prayers to Mary, I want you to think about this, actually puts her relationally before Christ. That's unbiblical too. The scripture says Christ is to have first place in all things. You don't pray to anybody else except Christ. 
You don't pray to Mary. You don't pray to the saints. It's Christ. You don't bow down to anybody else except Christ. Not even your pastor. Not even any religious leader. It's idolatry. And so if you take a look about at this passage here, it's not about Mary. It's about the magnificence of God in sending a Savior that He kept His promise. It's about what He was doing and about how He was going to use Mary. And yet this elaborate system, theological system, has been built upon and around Mary. And it needs to be exposed. It needs to be preached on. It's wrong theology. It's spiritually misguided. It's idolatrous if you pray to Mary. In one of the presidential debates um, a couple months back, uh, Joe Biden said in regarding the coronavirus lockdowns, he said it's going to be a dark winter, right? No, it'll be a dark winter if we don't start making it about God in this country or in our churches. That's where the dark winter is going to come from. The, the other observation here I want to make, uh, and it's uh, very subtle, but it's, it's there and, and we miss these things. It, it's about the truth regarding the person of Jesus Christ. Take a look at verse 43. I'm going to go back on this, uh, go back a little, a few verses. But consider, this is amazing, consider what Elizabeth, Mary's first cousin, said in verse 43, and she says, How has it happened to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Now, the mother of my Lord is the phrase I want to quickly look at. It's not the mother part that's profound, although it does point to the humanness of Jesus Christ. But it's the my Lord part that is profound here. How did, how did Elizabeth know that Mary was carrying her Lord. Think about it. What Elizabeth is saying here is that the child that Mary is carrying is her Lord. He's divine. And we read this, we, we, we read this stuff and we just totally gloss right over it, don't we? And so Elizabeth understood a very profound truth, and Mary understood a very profound truth. Jesus Christ is Lord, and Jesus Christ is God, my Savior. And many of you know the scriptures, but did not doubting Thomas say the same thing? Years later, after Christ was crucified and resurrected from the grave, Thomas was not in the upper room in that one account. But a week later, Jesus appeared when he was there so he could see and believe, right? And what did he say in verse 28? My Lord and my God. Remember we asked the question the other week, you know, Jesus asked the question in Matthew chapter 16 regarding his, he said to his disciples, who, who do people say that I am? And, you know, and some say, well, John the Baptist, and some say Elijah, and others say, you know, uh, Jeremiah and, and the prophets, or some of the prophets, right? And, what, and then Jesus said, but who do you say that I am? And, and Peter, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. It's all there, folks. Uh, one, one final thought here, if I may. Uh, take a look at verse 48. I know we're kind of jumping around a little bit. Verse 48, Mary mentions that all generations will call her blessed. For behold, from this time on, all generations will count me blessed. Now, uh, no doubt Mary was given a tremendous privilege and an honor uh, to bring the Christ into the world. Uh, this is uh, a special calling. It's a special role in the grand scheme of things. So, to be sure, we can say that Mary had a role in the redemptive process. She brought Christ into the world. But I would argue 
that Abraham had a role in the redemptive process. Moses had a role in the redemptive process. Joshua did. Samuel and the prophets did. King David did. Peter, Paul, and the disciples did. And you and I do as well. If you are saved, you have a role in the redemptive process. All things are redemptive. And so I would say to you this morning, is it not special and blessed to bear the name of Christ and bear the name Christian? Are we not blessed when we bear the name of Christ? Of course we are. Is it not an honor and a privilege to be placed in the body of Christ? To serve Him? To share Christ? To come to this table? You're a blessed people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people set apart for God's own possession. Now, make no mistake about it, all generations call Mary blessed, but Scripture teaches that this is also true of every single disciple. You may not have the role of Mary, and that's okay, God has different roles for different people. But if you are part of the body of, of Christ, if you know Christ is your Savior, you are a blessed person. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You're a blessed people. And it's all made possible because of God, my Savior. God, your Savior. It's as simple as that. As we transition to um, partake in the communion service, um, I, want you to, I, I want you to ask the simple question, can I truly say here this morning, God, my Savior. Uh, as, we, as we ask that question, we're going to sing uh, our communion hymn as we transition. We're going to sing number 348. 348, my Savior's love. We're going to sing verses 1, 4, and 5. But as we do that, I want you to ask the question, can I truly say this morning, God, my Savior. Please stand.